beautiful wife, Nellie, when she first came to see me, um, she had an experience too, and I told her story along with lots of other people. You may even be in the audience. I told her story on either that show or my show, and she said I wanted to, she wanted to meet me, so we, she flew out, we hung out for a while, and we got married. Uh, it, was, it, it wasn't that quick. It was like, I think, two, two hours at least. But anyways, so what happened was, she says, I want to go to these spots where all this stuff happened. But she has really bad anxiety. And I said, okay, let's go to the, the church. And I don't want to say the location because it's now been reopened as a functioning church. So I took her out there. And let me tell you something. When DA was talking about, you know, somebody urinating on a tree, let me tell you a story. We get out there and the well has been capped off. Because the guy that used to work for us, he told me and two of my guards, Anthony was with me and my friend Scorpion, I know you probably know who he is if you know who the show is. We were on TV together. Um, he told us a story when he was a kid of these things coming up out of a well and then hiding inside the what was then a defunct church. And it was a terrifying experience that he went through. So I took my wife out there and she was like, let's go out there, let's go out there. Uh, she's not really big on investigations and stuff, and neither am I, but I wanted to show her where it was at. So we drove up, we drove onto the property, and I saw that they had actually put a metal cover over this well. And they had bolted it in. So whoever was there that owned that property at that time, they knew that the well was a problem. And they knew that something was going on there. And since then, I've gotten two other stories that have to do with that well. Uh, not with, with the well, with the property, but it's not like something, you know, like it's just somebody saw something standing when they were driving by. There's like something was standing by a big oak tree and I saw it. It wasn't like a big, long story. So the activity is probably still going on. So this was about four years ago, five years ago. And uh, we went to the property and when we were leaving the property because she started having anxiety and feeling really scared because we heard noises. I, I couldn't help it. I had to use the bathroom very, very bad. And I'm not joking. Like, I would not have stopped at all. But I got about a mile down the road and I pulled off to a county road that I thought, this is far enough away. I can get out and relieve myself. And I had something happen that terrified me. Something came crashing through the brush. And I'm not joking. There was a pasture there and then there was a bunch of overgrown brush. You couldn't see into the pasture. And my wife had her window down, and she heard the noise. She rolled the window up and started screaming for me to hurry. And I'm not joking, something was coming at me really, really fast that sounded like it was five or 600 pounds. And it scared me, and I got in the truck real fast. And by the time we got back into town, she was having a full-blown panic attack. I thought she was going to go to the hospital. So, yeah, I, I, I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't think go, getting out and relieving yourself in their territory is a good idea. <laughs> That's the moral to the story. So I know what DA's talking about. So anyways, here, here is my encounter. How many of you have heard my encounter? Okay, so there's still some people who haven't. Okay. I was 15 years old. And my mother is, is Hispanic. She's Mexican. Basically, she's... Comanche and Spaniard, that's, you know, and my dad, he's, he's a, a, a butthole. But anyways, I ended up growing up 15 years in, in the country. First 15 years of my life, I barely wore shoes. I lived out in the sticks. My parents divorced, and I moved into the body of And so that's when, that's when you would think, hey, you're safe from anything out running around that's going to kill you and eat you, right? But uh, that's where I had my experience. I was in Taylor, Texas on October 31st, 1990. And I was 15 years old and I was with my best friend. And we were coming back from, we were egging cop cars. Um, that's kind of a tradition in my hometown. No offense to law enforcement, but we, we threw eggs at cop cars. 
And then if you, got, you didn't get caught, it was like, ah, oh, a bunch of fun. And the police, actually, all they would do is uh, hold you for a day, and then your parents would ground you, so they're pretty good sport about it. But they would also make your parents pay for the pain. So I didn't get caught that time. Um, so we were coming home, and I looked at the clock, and it was almost 11 o'clock, and I said, dude, I'm in so much trouble. And my friend's mother said, you know, she was real bad diabetic. She could barely see. She said, you know, I can't drive you, but um, I'm going to try and talk to your mother to come get you. Well, my mother had had enough of my shenanigans, and believe me, there was a lot of them. And she was like, I'm not going to come get you, pendejo, you walk home. <laughs> Her exact words to me, and she's apologized for years for this. She, she passed away last, not this man, but the man before. But she apologized to me, and she told me in Spanish, you know, may you see the devil. Which is, sometimes when Mexican moms get really mad, they'll throw a chancla at you, and sometimes they'll just tell you to see the devil, which is just like, you laugh it off, like, okay, yeah, whatever. Uh, I think I did. Because when we were coming back, there was a circle K on the corner, we came up to the, to the corner and I was complaining about how mean my mother was, which in reality, when you look back on it, I think 11 o'clock was a pretty generous uh, time to be inside. Because um, she knows I was gonna do it anyway. And I was complaining and my friend put his hand up on my chest and I stopped and I looked up and we saw in a ditch what we thought was a large German shepherd. Upon closer examination, we realized it wasn't and we thought it was a wolf. Then it stood up. That's when every story that I had ever been told as a kid came like it was real. The hambre lobo, la cadejo, la errona, la chusa, chupocara. I thought this is all mentiras, this is all bull crap. Everybody's bolita, that's your grandmother. They have a, a haunted room, okay? Everybody's got a cuckoo in the closet. And they would tell me this and I would be like, ah, this is bull crap, you know? And I thought I was a bad little chubby, though. I thought, I don't know, he's scared of none of this crap, you know? And then I realized, when you're staring at this thing, everything becomes real all of a sudden, and the possibilities become endless. This thing stood up and ran across the road, and I just remember looking down at my pants, and the bottom of my pants had soda all over my driving those big cups, you know, soda, and I had dropped it, and I was like, the Japanese call it satori. Everything kind of slows down. And I'm looking down and then I'm looking up and my, I felt this stinging pain in my neck on this side of my neck. My friend Daniel had grabbed my shirt to try to pull me away. He's told this story to my wife. And, you know, he's told this story to a lot of people. And he's open to talking about it. He hasn't come on the show. He is a preacher in my hometown. And I do one day hope that he'll, he'll come forward and just tell his version of it, which he's told to a lot of people in the private. And, um, but he ran, and I stood there, frozen. And um, he's always apologized to me like he left me, but he tried to grab me to pull me, and I just stood there, and my shirt got ripped. And so I began to walk back to his house, which was right there, there was, a, there, was a, there was another house right there next to it. it. had really high fences. The city had made them put up these really tall fences because they had pit bulls and they were drug dealers and they had been kicked out. It was a bad neighborhood. The least of, of your worries was a, a, a werewolf. And so I still couldn't believe what I was looking at. So I began to walk on wobbly legs past that house. This creature went in between the two houses and it just nonchalantly walked up to the fence. And as it got to the fence, it just kind of stood there judging the fence and judging me. Now, I've been told by people, well, dog, I wanted to eat you. It would have jumped over that fence. Blah, 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 blah. You, know, it, it, you know, and who knows why they do the things they do. But it didn't attack me, but it did grab the fence. And I remember seeing this weird paw-like hook you know, kind of claw, and I was walking by it, and I was kind of looking like this, trying not to stare directly at it, and Sal, my friend's uh, dad, he came out, and he's like, you know, very brave man, he stared right at it, looked at me, and told me to come on, and walk halfway out into the yard to meet me, and as I got closer, I walked faster, I couldn't run, 
I got inside and several of his family members saw it in the window. Um, for years, I thought that this thing was a flesh and blood creature, like some sort of, you know, whatever. And as they say, they say it's a paprika, like a curse, like that's what the hombre lobo is. And then I realized that the cadejo is something totally different. It's not the same as this thing. They're two different things. Cadejo is like the black dog, like old Shuck in the English, they, they call it old Shuck. I don't know, Nick, you know about that? Nick is one. Uh, I'm just kidding. So, I saw this thing one time, but I've interviewed probably a few hundred people at this point who have told me what they've seen. And not every encounter is the same. And I'm not telling you that every single person that gives you a story is 100% telling the truth or correct or they're remembering it correctly. I'm not here to judge that. But I do know that these things exist. A hundred percent, they exist. They're out there, they do what they do. My encounter happened in town. And when I was approached by Travel Channel about telling my story, I said, I can't do a show about that because it didn't happen in the woods. They said it's called uh, Terror in the Woods or uh, These Woods Are Haunted. I was like, well, they may be, but <laughs> it happened in the neighborhood, not in the woods. So I ended up going on there for another encounter I had, but it wasn't this. And I still to this day, I can only positively say that I've seen it one time. And I know that I have talked to a lot of people, and some of you may be in the audience tonight, who have told me their stories about these creatures. And I don't take it lightly. I don't think it's a joke. Sometimes when I tell people, they look at me and they kind of laugh and they think it's funny. I don't. Because I think that this thing shaped a lot of my psyche. I think, you know, as a young man, it gave me nightmares for years. For a long time, I had nightmares and I had to come to terms with it. And I think that a lot of people, they don't understand that aspect of it, the psychological aspect of it. Not to mention that you are looked at as a lunatic. As a kid, it's really hard because I was taken to shrinks and they were telling me, oh, you had a dream, you had a dream. No, it wasn't a dream, I know what I saw. And in fact, Linda Gothard wrote a book called I Know What I Saw. And Linda was one of the first people that I corresponded with uh, about 10, 12 years ago. I reached out to her, she reached out back and we've corresponded, we've been friends ever since. 2015, I reached out to Vic, and then, you know, we, we worked together, like I said, for years, until recently. And I have talked to a lot of people who've had these encounters. And like I said, I thought mine was completely physical until one day in 2019, I went to visit my friend's brother who was, who was remodeling a house. And as we were walking through the house, and I was with my nephew Anthony, who's in the back, we, the house that he was remodeling, someone had killed himself in that house. And it was on the street where this, where this particular incident took place. And we heard like a loud bang. And I look at him and I kind of made a joke and I was like, Uncle Kui, you know, is a key, you know, like, is this a ghost here, you know? And we started joking and laughing and then we kind of got serious and he was like, well, you know, that thing we saw, that you guys saw, and you brought back to the house, you know, and he told my nephew, he's always bringing stuff back to the house. <laughs> and I said, yeah. So I asked him to tell Anthony his version of it, and in all those years, at that point, it had been 29 years, he had not told that, I, like, I hadn't heard his whole version of it. I thought it was just everybody had their own version, it was just like mine. He said, well, this thing walked by the, the window of the kitchen, that it had a black vapor coming out the back of its neck. At that moment, it was like an epiphany. I was like, that means that maybe this thing wasn't completely physical. Maybe this thing is actually metaphysical. Maybe it's spiritual. And so I began exploring that more heavily. And I got heavily criticized. And I got to a lot of arguments. And I even got booted out of a couple of groups for
for voicing my opinion because I believe that before I started saying something, there was this push by the dogman community that it was a physical creature, it's an evolutionary creature, it is a flesh and blood creature, and someday we're going to discover it. But like Ken said, where is the, where is the evidence? You know, that thing that looked like a mouse, was it a possum, Ken? <laughs> that's, that's when we diverge from, from dogs? Okay. Now, I don't believe at all, and this is just my opinion, that these things are just a physical flesh and blood creature. And I'm going to say something that may shock the audience here tonight, I don't know, but I even believe that they can be shapeshifters. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not joking. Yeah. I'm being dead serious. If you guys have poured through the emails and the messages that I have, I, I promise you, I promise you, you would be thinking differently about these things. I'm going to tell you something. For those of you who haven't been keeping up with the live streams and the shows or whatever, and I know everybody's busy, but I have done a lot of talking recently because I've done a lot of research and a lot of investigating. There are a lot of computer companies, large computer companies, in Austin, in the area of Austin. And they all have campuses. And my business is security. And I have access to the security, you know, from those companies. I, I, I deal with them. In fact, I talked to one of the heads of, the, of one of those companies to fill some slots when you come to this conference. And you wouldn't believe the stuff that they tell me. Every six months to a year, these big shots come down from, from Europe and from Asia. And we used to live right next door to one of the large companies and they moved their campus or whatever. And one of the engineers lived above us in the complex where I, where I, I live. And he was from Pakistan and he was very open with me. And he told me one day when we were outside, um, he said, dude, you know, because we began to talk about weird stuff, because I always do. <laughs> and he said, you wouldn't believe what we've been seeing. And uh, this was several years ago. So me and my brother, we're outside talking to him. My brother actually met him first. He had to work, he couldn't be here. I wish he, I wish he could, my older brother. And he said, you gotta talk to this guy. This guy said that when the big shots came down from India, that they were seeing a weird hooded person walking through the hallway that would go into the rooms and disappear. And when they catch a glimpse of his face, it looked like a reptile. Yeah. Then they told me, and I, I got to meet the security, which one of them I'm still friends with to this day, a guy named Clint. He told me that they saw a white, skinny, wolf-like creature that was running through the woods. And it was seen by some of the workers. This is a very large company, large computer company. Fast forward to right around the beginning of the pandemic and I got a call from a listener whose son was the head of security for probably one of the largest computer companies on earth. And he said, hey, I wanna, I wanna bring you to our campus because I wanna show you a spot where I believe that these things inhabit. This campus is about 25, 30 acres and then it abuts up to about 120 acres of pasture. So me and Nellie and my brother and Anthony go out there to investigate. We interviewed four different guards who claimed to have seen a seven to eight foot tall werewolf. They didn't say dog man because they didn't know what, they don't, they don't know that term. They weren't, you know. And they were very forthcoming. And then I got to interview two female workers because at that time during the pandemic they, they had these weird rules where you had to they staggered the times to come in because, you know, and then you had to be out of the door by 8 o'clock because COVID only attacks after 8 o'clock. We know that, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, y'all have to go and run to the gym at the same time and go to Walmart at the same time because that's how you not, that's how you beat a pandemic. <laughs> Anyways, all these weird rules, right? So I talked to these women and they were like, yeah, I saw it. It was right over there. And it was all around this one rim of the outside of this, of this property. And guess what? On my show, his name is Nick. He's a good friend of mine. He doesn't say his last name, but he comes on the show anonymously. Um, 
he works at that company. And he gets in the elevator with one of these CEOs from Europe. And he said, dude, you're not going to believe what his face did. And before he finished the sentence, I was like, turn into a lizard. And he said, yeah. And he was on my show. He, he, I call him. He tells the story. He was looking in the mirror of the, of, of the elevator. And he goes, dude, I was looking down at my phone. And Nick is a big dude. He's like my size. He's this old school dude. This guy's from the hood in Chicago. He's not a scary guy. Like, oh, man, I'm scared. No, this dude is a big, tough guy. Nick is hood, you know? He was like, dude, I was terrified. He goes, I just kept looking at my phone, pretending like I wasn't seeing what I was seeing. And he goes, and the guy was looking over at me, and I'm like, he goes, I don't want to look up or look, you know? He goes, he got off the elevator, and I just stayed on. And I, he, he goes, I know it sounds crazy. I said, no, it doesn't. Because it's about half a dozen of these reports coming from these companies. And I'm going to tell you right now, what followed was a rash of werewolf sightings. You following me? I mean, this is like a, you know. So what I started putting together was that there could be a shapeshifter element to this. And what really did it for me was a, it was a guard named Joe. That's not his real name. I'll call him Joe. Who used to work at this company. And the head of security there said, I want you to interview this guy. He, he saw this thing two years ago. He tells me a story about one night, the end of his shift, it was about six in the morning, he was pulling out, and one of these things ran across the road and almost made him wreck. He said it looked like a 600 pound gorilla mixed with a wolf that ran out in front of his vehicle on all fours. It wasn't on two legs. And he nearly wrecked. And I said, let me ask you a question, Joe. Like, what year was this? He told me. And I said, was there anything going on in your company at the time that you saw this? And he said, yeah. We had heightened security because a bunch of the big shots were down from Europe. And he claims there was another guard that could, could corroborate that there was, he saw something at that time too, which I never got to talk to him. But I had heard enough. So looking at this situation, from all like angles. When you put it under a lens and you look at it from all angles, you do the math. And I knew that if I came up here today, it might be very controversial because a lot of people want to believe that these things are these dog man. When I was growing up in my hometown, there were legends of them, but nobody knew what the heck a dog man was. My brother stayed up in Michigan and he said, that's a dog man. That's how I knew what that term was. Because even talking to Linda, it was Beast of Bray Road. She talked a little bit about Michigan Dog Man, but it never stuck. I just thought Wolf Man, Werewolf, whatever, Omni Lobo. And the Latinos in my hometown, that's what they call it. It's Omni Lobo. The white people call it Werewolf. Native people call it a Skinwalker. And black people call it the Haint. My friend's uh, grandmother, I think my first experience actually was when I was about 11 years old with my friend Theo. Uh, he's lived out in the country, and his grandmother, she's an African-American woman, used to, used to dip snuff. <laughs> I'll never forget. And I watched her put a switch to him, and it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> because she said, I done told you boys, I'll be going down that holler. Them haints are down there, and they eat people. And she wasn't playing. And we saw a dark shape moving through the woods, and we got up, we dropped our crawfish pills, and we fell. Boom, we're out. And I was pretty fast. I was, I, I was pretty fleet funny. <laughs> and I got out of there, didn't see it, but I thought it was some sort of Bigfoot type creature, you know? Until I was 15 and I saw what I saw. And I know standing up here today, I want to tell you the unadulterated truth of what I know about these things. I don't want people to sit here and think that, you know, we're just looking at it from one angle because we're here to look at it from every possible angle. And I don't know what these things are, but I took my, my wife out to Copeland, Texas, and I actually had her listen to the howls coming out of that holler. And it doesn't sound anything like a Sasquatch. And one time, on episode 66 of my live stream, I had Steve Stockton on. And Steve Stockton was supposed to be here tonight. He couldn't be here. 
And that's unfortunate for COVID. But he was on my show. And I'm not real sure, I think it's the one minute, one, uh, one hour, one minute mark, something like that. You can hear a howl on the show. And Steve kind of paused. I didn't hear it. But then after the show, some of my listeners were like, did you notice that there was a weird howl that, that, that you know, was heard? So I, I called Steve and I said, did, was that on your end? He goes, no, dude, I don't live by no major highway, you know, whatever. And maybe it's a vehicle, you know, I don't know. And he thought, I thought it was on your end. And he thought it was some sort of like uh, either a vehicle or he thought maybe it was a, uh, uh, like a, what do you call it when I'm trying to tell him to like, wrap it up or whatever. And I said, no. So I don't know what that was. But I think, we weren't even talking about dogmatic, but I think that there is a spiritual aspect to this stuff too. One of my colleagues, uh, Dark Waters, who was invited to the conference, his kids started college this coming week, so he couldn't make it. But we have talked extensively about this, and he believes, like I do, that there is a spiritual attachment that comes with this. And I think that these things can inhabit people. Um, I've heard of people being possessed, and, and their faces changing into wolf-like creatures. And I think that there is some credence also to the fact that maybe these things existed for a long time and our government or some, some form of a shadow government could actually be uh, militarizing these things, which is one of the theories of the LBL. Some people believe that that is the case. I don't deny that that could be a possibility. And I've also thrown the theory out there that they could have been created by a race of beings I call the Anunnaki. Raise your hand if you know what that is. Okay. The Anunnaki, according to, I did a show with Paul Wallace, and I'm sure that, that Nick knows what the Anunnaki are, and David, you probably know, you've probably heard of it. The Anunnaki are what many people believe to be our progenitors. They were giants, because it's Genesis 6. And if you read the book of Enoch, it is the long version of Genesis 6. And it says that there are giants in those days. And I believe that they used stargates. And I believe that they used, just like Nick's new book coming out, anti-gravity, to build the pyramids. I believe they had the technology. I've had remote viewers tell me that they did beauty. And a lot of these names we have for God and for gods are actually the names of Anunnaki kings because they lived for thousands of years. That, that's not discounting that there is one true God. I do believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in God. But we may have been seated here by them. And somebody asked me, well, why would they be so much bigger than us? It's very simple. If I was going to create a slave race, I would make them this big. Because if they got out of hand, <laughs> You don't feel like digging? Really? That's it. Game over. You don't give them weapons, you don't give them technology, they're just slaves. That's what they do. They're just they're Smurf Village, basically. And then somebody said, well, why would they create a dog man? Why wouldn't you? If you get out of line, Anubis and his creatures are going to eat you. If you try to escape, they'll hunt you down. And you put them at a human level intelligence. They exist for thousands of years. They maybe forget their roots. Imagine if we colonized Mars and then they forgot about us and they left and you're just there. Then you, like we are, we're a people with amnesia. Our history only goes back a few thousand years. Come on, dude. So what happens is the Anunnaki, are, they, they leave or whatever, they're gone. The remnants of them still exist. There's sh skeletons being dug up every, you know, every day. They get snatched up. Um, but these dogmen are still here. They know how to manipulate fourth density, fourth dimension. This is just one theory. I'm not saying I'm subscribing this. I'm just throwing it out there for you guys because I want to give you every possible scenario. They have an ability that we can't even comprehend. You can look at the second dimension from the third dimension and it's just flat. 
And if you drew a stick figure on a second dimension piece of paper, it cannot hide anything from you because you're in the third dimension. We are in the fourth dimension, or say you're in the fourth dimension, or fourth density as they call it. You can see everything that the third dimension is doing. That's why it appears when they pop out of nowhere, it's like they're magic. It's not magic, it's science. And I believe that there could be an element that has learned how to harness that. Maybe they've captured some of these things, the physical form. Because like Linda Godfrey and me, we postulated for hours together. We've talked for so many, just, I can't even tell you how long I've talked to her and Barton and so many people in this field. And we've talked about these. If they're on this plane of existence, they have to drink water, they have to eat, they have to, to live, right? Like we do. So then they can be captured, they can be, they can be uh, killed, yeah, they can be killed. But they can be weaponized. And what a lot of people say is going on here in the LBL is just that. Do I believe that personally? I have no idea. But these are just theories. And it's just some of the theories that I've gone over and, like I said, postulated on since I've been doing this. And I felt like if I didn't come up here and tell you everything I believe and everything I know about these creatures, I'd be doing you a disservice. And I could tell you case after case after case. It is so weird when you think you get it figured out and there's a new element to it. And the correct answer could be that it's all of the above. If you liked this video, be sure to check out our other content and get connected on our page and social media sites. Every day, new discoveries are being made all across the world and beyond, so let's work together to find out what's next. And remember, we won't know if we don't go. I'll see you in the Vortex.